It's a long colonial tradition that indigenous peoples are on the receiving end of the scientific gaze. I study and promote indigenous resistance to colonial science and indigenous efforts to transform and govern science and technology. It's commonly thought that racial science ended a long time ago. We hear it mischaracterized as pseudoscience. But distinguished scientists practiced then cutting edge science. Nazi Germany took foundational lessons from the US and Britain. Here you see it in a textbook, The Hierarchy of Man, with the Greek skull at the pinnacle. Viewed as less evolved, the Negro sits just above the ape. Other 19th century illustrations show the American Indian below the Greek. Fast forward to 1939. A German scientist measures a Tibetan woman's cranium. He advised Nazi doctors later on race science. In the mid-20th century, experiments were conducted on First Nations people in Manitoba and in six residential schools across Canada. Indigenous people, some of them almost starved, were used as a living laboratory for nutrition scientists to pursue research questions about which they were curious. Number one, was the shiftless, indolent, inert Indian really simply a malnourished subject? Number two, were foods supplied by traders after Indians were removed from their land inadequate in light of modern nutritional knowledge? Those are quotes. In the 1990s, the Havasupai who live in the Grand Canyon gave blood to Arizona State University for diabetes research. They later learned that samples and data were also used for human migrations research, which they do not support. And they learned that their data informed a schizophrenia grant, which they forbade. The principal investigator still defends her rights to their DNA. It doesn't have to be that way. Here you see the Pinoleville Pomo Nation in California and Berkeley architecture and engineering faculty and students collaborating to build green housing. Tribal youth, elders, elected leaders, and planners worked with professors and students in a co-design process that combined cultural and environmental sustainability. Cultural and technical knowledges were valued. Collaborators learned that both indigenous people and scientists bring cultural ideas to define sustainability. The Berkeley crowd brought secular and urban-centric ideas, while Pomo tend to have bigger families or more rural, and they wanted east-facing windows for morning prayers. Both parties also learned that they each bring technical know-how, for example, related to building materials. Students earned degrees, published papers with faculty, the tribe got beautifully designed sustainable housing, and developed green building codes. Having regular contact with diverse students, children in the community set their sights on perhaps attending Berkeley. They might even become engineers. It's a chicken and egg problem that diversity in science generates more diversity. Diverse identities bring diverse values and experiences, but a word of caution. Whatever one's personal identification, training as a scientist, big S, involves indoctrination into the privileges conferred by the symbolic white lab coat. For centuries, scientific institutions have considered diverse bodies and cultures deviant. Western-defined truth has been seen as existing in opposition to non-Western backwardness. I've learned that there are two ways to diminish colonialism in science. The first involves collaborative research. The second is to train diverse scientists in a way that takes a decolonial approach. Indigenous scientists and their cultural advisors might ask different questions. They might invent culturally sensitive lab protocols. These possibilities are highlighted at the Summer Internship for Indigenous Peoples in Genomics, SING, founded in 2010 in the US, which expanded to New Zealand in 2016. With collaborators here at the U of A and at Simon Fraser, I am planning SING programs that will focus on salmon genomics and other indigenous traditional food sources. Finally, indigenous peoples govern through science. Here the Amamutsun Band in California does collaborative landscape and fire management with the California Department of Environmental Quality and with non-indigenous landowners. Settler wildlife suppression has been devastating. Local and indigenous knowledges are drawn upon to change that. The National Center for Indigenous Genomics in Australia brings indigenous community members and researchers into a national conversation about how to do genomics differently with indigenous priorities centered. You also see here a less ideal example of governance through science. Indigenous peoples in the US and Canada use DNA tests in membership. But DNA testing companies tend to be uninformed about indigenous politics and population movements post-colonization. Indigenous peoples need scientists that understand not only science, but also social contexts. Only then can indigenous peoples effectively govern science and govern effectively through science. Thank you.
Thank <laughs> you.